It was probably the insane slaughter of the Battle of the Somme which finally convinced the British that warfare need no longer be played to the rules of cricket. Why run straight out the guns when you can infiltrate behind them? This strategic evolution produced some colourful new units. The Long Range Desert Group, Pomsky's Private Army, the Lovett Scouts, the Cockle Shell Heroes and the SAS. There was little emphasis on burnished badges or glittering toe caps. The premiums were initiative, subterfuge, courage and survival. Such a unit is the mountain and arctic warfare cadre of the Royal Marines. It must be conceded that Captain John Lear's arrival at his office is hardly an exercise in stealth. Since the Russians monitor all these military documentaries, they might as well know from the outset that he commands the training of the mountain and arctic warfare cadre and does not like desk work. Equally, Sergeant Mac McLean's arrival, like some spin-off from the Tour de France, is evidence of the unit's informality rather than some gullible disguise. He hates desk work also. The headquarters in Plymouth is immediately opposite the intelligence section. Here too, there appears to be an expedient solution to the tedium of paperwork. All the stores are issued, they're ready to go. The coach is ordered for 0830. Okay. Ship it down there. The casualness, even eccentricity of it, should not dispose you to believe that what you will see in these programmes is some kind of situation comedy in khaki. They're planning the examination and possible recruitment of 25 men to an elite corps. Well, let's look forward to a good four weeks, good weather. And stuck to Joyce's yeah. Oggies, eh? Stuck to Joyce's <laughs> Oggies, yeah. Right, OK. OK, Magic. Their initiation starts here, in a village near Land's End. For some, swiftly, it will also be Journey's End. The standards are quite uncompromising, and there will be many days and nights when this command post, in retrospect, will seem like Claridge's. Thompson, no mail for you today. Thanks. Good job. <laughs> 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 yeah, when we give you these presents and things, obviously it's not for being bitchy or anything like that. It's just to build up your strength. Make a, a joke about it, because it needs to be, because you do so many, it's no good being miserable. And laugh every time you do it. Okay? For the slightest little thing, I'll make you do press ups. I'm doing with you, obviously. You can make me. If you ever catch me with my hands in the po my pockets, you can give me press ups. 20 for catching me. <laughs> <laughs> that gives me to get you 40. The perennial punishment for offences actual or invented is the press-up. It causes no resentment. All are volunteers, men and officers from every branch of the Royal Marines, from the Special Boat Squadron, the Dutch Marines, and from the Australian SAS. All rank among the candidates is suspended. In the eyes of God and Sergeant McLean, all applicants are equal. OK, we'll screw around the lads' court a bit. You're all court wall. No need to bother with it. Just say court wall or whatever. We'll screw around the court wall, lands court wall, acting lieutenant. Okay, OK? If it's not how the Brigade of Guards would carry on, it's because the sole function of these men is to fight in pitiless terrain in appallingly low temperatures. Here's the next climbing area. 
That's right. He should have known it, shouldn't he? I mean, he's been thinking about it all weekend. Both these men, as did 21 of the 22 British candidates, saw action in the Falklands. While here that experience now counts for nothing, there are certainly no rules about them being opinionated. There are times, um, not just, I won't just say places like Northern Ireland and the Falkland Islands, when you are dealing with people's lives. Probably more so in this uh, qualification we're going for now, the MLS course. Uh, you make the wrong decision and people can and will die. Uh, and I think it's, that doesn't come across to the, the average man in the street. He thinks a, a serviceman is someone who, as Digger said, has got all the creature comforts. Every now and again he go and does his bit. And um, most of the time he's a, a drunken lout who makes the most of the time he's got off, basically. And is generally not a nice person to know. Uh, and it's just not true. Uh, everybody has the part to play. And it's a classic example. I mean, one minute you can be the the uh, the most obnoxious bunch of cretins on God's earth, and then something, an incident somewhere in the world blows up. You have to go to and sort out, and you become hand slapping, back slapping, thigh slapping, the best bunch of kiddies we could ever have. Well done, boys. You know, you've done your bit once again. We're proud to be British and all that. It rankles a bit sometimes. Yeah. When um, you come back, you become the brutal and licentious. Well, that's right. <laughs> within, within weeks of coming back from Northern Ireland or the Falklands or anywhere, uh, all it takes is one small incident in a garrison town, such as Plymouth, Armbrough, all the shot anywhere. And um, once again, you, you're wrecking bars and pinching cars and punishing civilians and God knows what. Uh, the, the British public are great people, but they have got hellish short memories. Your mascot. Well, you've had a lot of bad luck with mascots. And it started off, <laughs> if I remember correctly, in the selection course, where I gave you a new, uh, snoot in the actual fact, it was a salamander. <laughs> and it mysteriously disappeared or died. I've yet to find out what happened to it. Although when the course finished, it was perfectly OK. But then when we got back down here in September, it had died. That was the newt. Then I gave you a frog, which didn't even have a name, because you only had it two hours. And that died. <laughs> Then we had a black beetle, which I do believe last Saturday someone ate. <laughs> I'm determined that you should have a mascot. So what I've done, at great expense, <coughs> is got you a peregrine falcon. The reason I've got this type of bird is because it needs to be tough, because all the mascots in the past have died under your care. But this one, being a fighting bird, will not die. <laughs> right, lads. A peregrine falcon. <laughs> Steady. Is it now? Training manual. Like, there's a training manual here for it. I want to see it sort of um, bringing down meat off the hoof in a week. <laughs> okay. Who's going to? Who's due, student? <laughs> Obviously, it's the mating call of the falcon. So watch out, boys. <laughs> <laughs> who's you? Right, Corbin, cross it. It's all yours. <laughs> Remember, you need the glove. But be careful, because you need your fingers and that for climbing. I don't want anyone to see it off. It needs a name by 12 o'clock. I like the course. Are you happy with it? What brand of men are they? Here's the head of training for the Marine Special Forces, Major General Julian Thompson. 
Well, I would think he's actually a rather a special sort of chap. He may actually be not the sort of fellow who's standing in the front rank looking terribly smart, who catches everybody's eye. He, I think he's got to be, and I've always described it as rather like a badger, really, to have this ability to, uh, almost like an animal, and I don't mean it in any derogatory sense, suborn his personal feelings of discomfort and take no notice of them and almost sort of switch off the feeling of discomfort at the same time not switch off his other senses so that he's sort of dozing away and doesn't notice what's going on and he must also be an absolutely first-class marine soldier I say go, we'll see the last man doing the transport. Stand by, go! Right, mate, catch up in the rear! All the way down! By definition, the mountain and arctic warfare carder doesn't attract too many vertigo sufferers, but even so, 23 of the 25 have never climbed before. Their testing ground is here, the jagged promontories of Land's End. These may be mere nursery slopes compared with what lies ahead, but they still face an initiation test calculated to sort out the likes of you and me from the likes of them. OK, what we're going to do this afternoon now is the thing that you've all been psyched up for all week is the Land's End Long Jump. And really, there is nothing to it, nothing to get ex exaggerated about. We used to do it as part of the Cliff Top Run. We used to run down from Logan's Rock, right round here, running kit, just the first bloke across jumped it and everybody followed the leader. If you do, by some chance, miss, Sergeant Brown will catch you, that's what he's there for. Because there's a strong wind blowing, don't think that you've got to jump to the right to compensate for the strong wind. Just get down there and jump across. Well, I'm just going to do a quick demonstration now. To prove how confident I am, I won't use any harness. All right? Just to show you how easy it is. But for you, because you're students, you'll be roped on. OK. This is the start position. Stand on here. Get your bottle in your hand. You're out in your mouth. And just take the flying leap out. And that's all there is to it. Aim to get your feet on about this pancake here. And you'll, you'll get on it quite easily. All right, any questions? How long have you been laid here? Take coils in your hand. Oh, no, good positive down, movement when you go. Five. When are you ready? Smaller coils than that. Aye, aye. Go on, don't hang about. The longer you hang about, the harder that will be. As soon as you're ready, just go. Go on, go for it. Go for it. Go on. The deal is brutally frank. It is to establish nerve. They either leap the gap 270 feet above the rocks or their new career stops right here. Phase two is the first encounter with a rock face. Many of these men are experienced parachutists, but the challenge here is entirely different. Aye, aye. I remember sort of getting halfway and freezing. I was thinking, what am I doing here? And I reached for this hold, and I felt myself starting to go. And I just managed to get it. And I vowed there and then, once I got to the top, that I would never sleep on a top bunk again. Like anybody else, you still get frightened up there. 
uh, on, on the rock and you talk to some of the more experienced MLs and they'll tell you they still sometimes get frightened themselves. What do you think of the climbing? Do you have any problems? Yeah. I fell, off, way. fell off the demo route the first time. You fell off the, well, the demonstration route you were doing? Different. Not the demo route. That's something different which will fall off at a later stage. Uh, what have you done this morning so far? Uh, the, the top hat there over there. Okay, what do you think of that? It was quite difficult on the on the over, actual overhang. How do you feel about it? Shit Actually, you, you shit yourself? <laughs> oh. Okay, good. Well, I'll be talking to you some other time as well. Okay. I guarantee I'll be watching you a lot. All right. Good. In fact, little more watching was necessary. There's no stigma about being returned to your unit for attempting what few sane people would have attempted in the first place. The man failed honourably because he couldn't handle the challenge of a vertical rock face. He wasn't alone in that. Basically because we're climbing the day at Besegrin and I felt uneasy all the climbs, that the, well the two climbs that I did at Besegrin. I didn't feel at all at ease on them. And we did Commando Ridge and I started to get a bit terrified in Commando Ridge. And I thought about it at night and I thought well the climbing wasn't for me and I didn't want to do it. So I come up and I seen Sam McLean in the morning and and has to be removed of the course. And then he told me no, and think about it. I thought about it more in the morning. The more I thought about it, the more I was scared to go back on the rock. And then I was, he took me away and he took me on some problems. He started me off on the problems again, going back to, back to square one again, just starting off. We come up on the problems. At the end of the day, I felt really great. I got my confidence back in myself and then climbing on the rock. So I decided to change my mind, stay on the course. I think I've done it now. I think that I'll be able to go and I'll be able to climb the rock now. It takes a lot of courage, though, to also admit that you don't want to do it. Well, that was the biggest part, was admitting that I didn't want to do it. That was, I didn't want to do that, but I felt that I had to. Next week, we'll put him with um, either myself or Sergeant Major, and we'll nurse him through, probably not quite so fast as the other people, um, until we think that he's got his confidence then and towards the end of the week we'll start giving him more exposure um, when his, his confidence comes and we'll know when it does or not and I think um, probably be okay, no problem at all. But there was a problem. He didn't make it either. The criteria at this stage are absolute. A harsh decision now can save lives later. On the fifth day a third man failed the candidate from the Australian SAS. The third person didn't attend the selection course. He's come from a faraway country but once again I think it's his major problem is his physical fitness his medical fitness and his mental fitness his mental attitude towards it um, I think he could do it if he wanted to and if he'd been a bit fitter he'd have no problems at all I don't know how much he's using his medical problems as an excuse to get off the course but he has used it he said that he has got problems so tomorrow obviously I'm gonna to have to make some rather quick telephone calls to some fairly senior people and see what's going to be done about him. <coughs> At the end of the week, and each week thereafter throughout this preliminary nine-month course, senior members of the CADA assess each man's progress. It's perhaps as well that the candidates can't sue for slander. Craig. You wanted me to allow him to take 20 feet of slack. <laughs> and then jump out the chopper because he wasn't getting a good start off. <laughs> We're thinking of electing him the most ugly man of the ML2 schools. <laughs> After a week at Land's End, abseiling 200 feet out of a helicopter is regarded as a mere games afternoon. No training to be instructor. You'll have to show a bad example, okay? 20. Admonishments are frequent. The most punitive punishment remains the press up. You should know this from being at Limston. 20 cells. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> Legion, eh? That's not part of your uniform. 20. There's no barrack square balling. It's all done with almost courteous restraint. Did it? Oh, 
Oh, have you all got your piece of rope in your pocket? Yeah. yeah. Right, stand up, tie a dick's knot. How many press ups do you want if we haven't got our right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll have uh, 40 set ups out of you then. <laughs> It seems unlikely that any of God's creatures would actually volunteer to become the Carter's mascot. However, promotion to the rank of Falcon appears to have induced a sense of security. Well, he was very noisy at first, and he wasn't very popular. <laughs> I think people were trying to strangle him and uh, flush it down the loo. And now uh, yeah, you catch them secretly talking to it. When you come in, they pretend they weren't. Penny Pool, at other times, is a Cornish beauty spot well known to poets and artists. The only artistry demanded of a marine commando here is that he should traverse this Atlantic cauldron without falling in. At high tide, this neither Arctic nor mountain challenge is easier said than done. For some, with heavy seas pounding through the gap, the limit of ambition is to hang on. Two people standing around there for these big coppers. I don't want anybody going in there. Just unclip that, somebody up there. For Corporal Grant, hanging on is both agonising and essential for survival. His right shoulder has been torn completely from its socket. Where's the dog? Get that rope, somebody. Get that rope. One man safe, but now his rescuers must save themselves. There are actually three men there somewhere in the water. Last man out and lucky. If that wave had been as massive as the last, his next stop could well have been in the neighborhood of Boston, Massachusetts. Probably quite fortunate that I got the rope round that, the guy that was injured and Chris and the other guys jumped in, which jammed, which tended to jam the whole zone up. I think it's just the two of us have been swilling around, and then we might well have got swept out and off the ledge. And especially the guy with the injured army, there's no way he'd have got out. Take a good real Tim But you thought your time had come, didn't you, there? Yeah, I did for a while. I was in that, that cave, yeah. <laughs> there didn't seem to be uh, much happening in the way of getting me back out again. When was the last time that uh, you, you thought you weren't going to live to see the following day? <laughs> As, uh, I took a bullet through the chest, I think, was the last time. Uh... <laughs> OK, you still got another hour's work, then. Don't worry about it being a bit wet. Carry on with the problem. Close on all the tubes, close on those that went in. OK, you've got another hour's work left. There are no concessions. It isn't that sort of club. Uh, it was unfortunate. The sea was running a bit high, but Lance Corporal Grant, unfortunately, just happened to come off after he'd done the problem. He 
came off, his hand was left in there. But as I say, it's all part of the actual character building of the ML2. You've got to have a person who, when he is wet through, soaked wet through, and perhaps freezing in Norway, is able to turn round to be at a half company or 30 men and smile and generate motivation within them. And to do that, you've got to do these little, shall we say, foibles that have been in the course for years. They are part of the course and everyone expects to do them. Here are some more of the Carter's little foibles. Not the old road trick. Everybody knows the road trick. They're expected to climb anything set before them. In this case, a traverse of the seawall at Senan Cove. I don't want to see anybody dry. <laughs> to the Queen's enemies, perhaps even to the Queen herself, the horseplay must seem dangerously close to anarchy. Get him! What military system is it which permits a sergeant to be roughhoused by his men? Next, they steal the keys of the instructor's transport. No one escapes, not even the director of this film. But the skylarking can be switched off in an instant. Sunset heralds the next stage in the curriculum. After just one month on course, they take to scaling cliffs in darkness. Right, what I want to do now is confirm with you again your, the climbs you're actually going to do. Cobble Dale, you're on corner climb. Cobble Mills, staircase. Cobble Craig, corner climb. Lieutenant Smith, banana flakes. Yes. Call one Nash, Call main face. You sure you're up to it, Nash? OK, and on completion of this brief, what I want is no smoking, no talking, and no lights. Is that understood? The only illumination is from a pale moon and a distant lighthouse. What you're seeing here comes courtesy of science. It's being filmed through image intensifiers, which give an accurate impression of what it's like to peer through the night sights of a rifle. The test piece rock face is 80 feet high. Really scary up here if you don't think about it. I'm still sweating now. It is in situations like these that you discover why the instructors never need to raise their voices. They earn respect and maintain authority by sheer example. Climbing down a cliff face in darkness is even trickier than climbing up. Sergeant Mac McLean sets off without ropes. So if, see how it goes to reverse this uh, diff climb on left banana flakes. It is a way down that we use quite a lot. I know it very well. Although, I do climb it at night. You just have to feel around uh, and look, but not with your hands, where my feet are going to go 
Once I've found a foothold, I can then go back to cash with her. I have three points of contact. No, and they're somewhere there. Nice and easy for my feet. Great. There's a case of testing all the holes in the normal way. Bit of a stretch there, but not bad. Lovely rock, this granite. So. Now, what I have to do is work my way down the outside of this rib here. Stacks of handholds. No problem. Now, this is a small leap across. Uh, well, it's no good waiting, you want to just do it. If you hesitate. <coughs> got it. It's got my finger there. The thing is, you can see the what we're jumping on. Can't see how near the wall is down here. Difficult. To alleviate the anxiety of next of kin, the trainees do have the benefit of ropes. Quite a big gap here. When you get to this part of the uh, the um, gully, so what you have to do is bridge it like so. It's quite easy coming down, but it's slippery. Though. There's a little waterfall coming down here at the moment. That's the case. Now. These are normal techniques. Nice hand holes, one of them. Feel around somewhere to put the feet. And just climb it as you would during the day, really. I'm going to see if I'm going to make that move there. I have to move around a bit. I think it's, I think it's trying not to scramble. Get some adrenaline down a bit. That's when you do it at night and it gives you at one with what you're doing, I suppose. Yep. Up on the top. And that's it. Grip tight gully and banana flakes. Gives you a nice sensation when you finish that. McLean is safely back up, and so, without a scratch, are all his pupils. But these are only the foothills of an Everest of training. From the cliffs of Cornwall, they now move on to an altogether different challenge in the bleak terrain of the Hebrides. There, they were set out to prove that there can be life after Egon Rone. It's about survival behind the lines, and it's not for the squeamish. 